Challenge the Change Agents. Expel Group Manipulation from Political Meetings. Presented by Edward J. Harshman. This video presentation is dedicated to the fight for fair and honorable dealings with and within the government. Public Hearings, Sometimes Not for the Public. Government branches or non-government planners sometimes have public hearings or meetings to show support for what they are trying to do. Sometimes the presenters are honest, but more often they are not. These hearings are usually to try to obtain public support or the illusion of public support for one or more projects. Your mission is to make sure that such hearings are honestly run, or if not, then expose the deliberate dishonesty. Suppose in the private sector, nothing to do with government, someone comes up with an idea that helps some people greatly and harms other people moderately. Is this a good idea? Should it be adopted? If the people who are greatly helped pay for the harm that they inflict, then they are helped less overall, but no one is harmed net because those who were harmed get paid for the damage inflicted on them. If the harm exceeds the good, then the idea is bad. Good idea in the private sector. The total benefit exceeds the total harm, and those who benefit pay fair compensation to those who are harmed. Business arrangements between company and company, or between company and consumer, occur very often and follow this principle. Ordinary merchandise. Buy it at the store. Go to work. Get paid. It happens all the time. Bad idea in the private sector. The total dollar amount of the harm exceeds the dollar amount of the good, so proponents of the idea cannot afford to enact it without special efforts, such as asking for donations. The key concept here, if an idea, planning and zoning, protecting wilderness, altering school curricula, etc., is not banned by law and provides more good than harm, then it would have already been acted on. If a public hearing is not intended to repeal a law or is intended to affect a specific plan, watch out. The hearing is intended to bring about public support for something that does not provide more good than harm. The Honest Public Hearing Government officials seek citizen opinions. If there is a movie shown, it is available beforehand too and not first seen by the public at the hearing. A protocol for discussion is disclosed and it permits the speaking of diverse viewpoints and does not favor one opinion over another. Having people line up at a microphone to ask questions prevents censorship of questioners by the presenters. The presenters will have to call on people in the line regardless of whether the questioners are hostile to the presenters or not. If people are called on by the presenters where they sit or stand, then the people calling on people may be biased and not call on someone who is known to disagree. In the honest public hearing, no psychology tricks are used. The audience is drawn in and feels connected to the process. The dishonest public hearing. There is an intent to bring about a predetermined conclusion. There may be an undertone that something is wrong, something not easily described. Participation by the public is limited, often subtly. There is a vague feeling about not being connected to the process, a feeling that something is wrong. The public is asked to fill out questionnaires and or participate in small discussion groups. These discussion groups are known to be fertile ground for group manipulation. Uh, I don't think it's honest. I think they're actually presenting options that they already are limited to, or they want you to be limited to. And so they want to make, it, uh, make you believe that it's your idea, that you had an input and that you came up with this stuff. And so then they use that report back or whatever they're doing as evidence that yes, this has a groundswell of approval or we're not going to have many problems or blah, blah, blah. Here are examples of manipulation pro-environmentalist music in the background during voting, the presenter admits an intent to enforce what has already been decided on, and the presenter admits an intent to frustrate the participants at the meeting.
Now, a confession. I'm, uh, I, I put myself through university as a DJ, and so I have selected a little song to entertain you while you're voting on each of these issues, and I've tr chosen the song to kind of get you in the mood of the issues that we're talking about. So, uh, hopefully you're entertained by it. We're going to go on to the first one, which is clean air. We are here today to um, implement what we had envisioned and what MTC and ABAC had envisioned in terms of complying. Um, as I've been saying in these forums, if you leave today feeling frustrated or this was complicated, then in some ways we've done our job right. People at the hearing. There is a presenter, also known as a facilitator, or if brainwashing is known or suspected, a provocateur, or more than one presenter. There are the neutrals, or the rest of the audience. Your mission is to communicate to and influence them. If they learn of manipulation by the presenters, you win. There is the enemy, people, perhaps in one or more organized groups, who push for something you consider wrong. Note, an honest hearing can include an enemy group, or even more than one enemy group. The enemy. City council members, union members tipped off by their union bosses, environmental activists, and people with a self-interest in the outcome of the meeting. They can be told in advance to attend it. Notice to the general public is less prominent, leaving the public underrepresented. Suspect insider dishonesty if the meeting is not well publicized and numerous people with special interests in the outcome disproportionately attend, relative to the public at large. Is a lively discussion wanted or not? Presenters say that they want a lively discussion. They don't want people to leave. But watch what happens later when the discussion content is not what they want. Hooray for the heckler heroes. So you cannot leave early. So it'll look really bad if people leave early. We want a full room and engaged and exciting conversation. This is not a policy uh, setting session. This is about learning about what's important to you. So. Let's just learn about what's important to you and how you would rank these things. We've got plenty of discussion time planned. Trust the process. There's going to be lots of time for discussion. I want to make sure we answer your questions. Unfortunately, because we have a fairly packed program, we can't be fielding all of the questions that this would be raising. But we're here today to get a sense of what your priorities are. We can't get into the details until we know what your priorities are. We are only equipped this morning to deal with the priorities that are up on the screen. Principles of fighting back. Fight. Don't be polite. If you notice evidence of dishonesty in how the hearing is conducted, then disregard ordinary politeness. What is right may feel unnatural or be rude. You don't want to win a popularity contest. You want to win the debate. Or, more realistically, make the enemy lose it. The presenters and the enemy overall will not be won over to your cause whatever you do if the hearing is dishonest. Your mission is, instead, to expose the dishonesty to the neutrals. Herding. As with sheep, it is easier to herd many people and make them go where you want than it is to herd one or two. For a dishonest presenter to herd the group, it must function as one with a consensus and with no dissenters. The presenter wants to establish consensus, no dissent, then the group will follow the presenter's lead. You want to preserve individual thought. You prefer some dissent to no dissent at all. Watch for tricks to suppress individual thought and be ready with your own tricks. Productive Passivity Productive passivity is a consequence of watching movies and TV. Movies and TV shows are designed to not alienate any current or potential future advertisers. Jobs, if shown in detail, never are such that an audience can learn how to not spend money by acquiring the skills of the portrayed characters. Not only are movie and TV audiences made more receptive to commercial advertisements, but they are made more receptive to political manipulation by the same mechanisms of thought. Consequences. Loss of initiative. Tendency to accept opportunities and problems as they are presented to oneself. No aggressive seeking of opportunities or of creative ways to solve problems. 
no interest in reinterpreting apparent opportunities and apparent problems so as to find better ways to solve them, easily led by the presenters. The trance state. The audience can be presumed made malleable by television. First, with no demand for feedback from the audience as there is with real conversation, there is a tendency toward emotional laziness. Second, with the shutdown of such feedback, a form of self-referencing introspection can occur. Third, rapid changes of scene and cleverly designed commercials are intended to induce a trance, and the audience is trained to expect to enter a trance with any presentation, television or otherwise. In the context of the public hearing, productive passivity is bad, neutrals probably afflicted and vulnerable to psychobabble, bad, Neutrals probably will accept the recommendation of experts simply because they are experts. Bad. Dishonest presenters will generally try to plan a presentation so as to inspire passivity and vulnerability. Bad. The audience can easily enter a trance and be very suggestible. Productive passivity is good. The enemy expects the audience to be passive and has probably planned accordingly. Good. The presenters themselves may have productive passivity tendencies. Good. You can greatly interfere with enemy presenters if you contrive to interfere with trance induction. Good. Showing truth and logic will recruit many neutrals. Preparation for the hearing. First, learn the issues. Second, anticipate possible attacks and prepare specific responses. Third, prepare generic handouts. These handouts should not be pertinent to the specific subject matter of the hearing, but should be about dishonest hearings generally. Use them at all hearings, not just one. It's okay to prepare specific handouts about the facts of the issues to be discussed, too. Try to distribute two different handouts, one generic and one for the specific hearing. The Issues Learn details such as who benefits with money if the enemy gets its way, who paid for studies that are presented, etc. Then you can refute a misleading or false statement later. If the hearing is arranged by a paid consultant, that fact is important. Spell it out in any literature you circulate. Learn more than you need about the issues. It's a shill catching tactic. More on that later. Also, prepare a very complicated fact-based question. It's a tactic in case someone says that an issue is complicated. Anticipate possible attacks. Defend against slogans. Anticipate what slogans the presenters may use, probably in the media already, and prepare a rejoinder. If the presenter gets his way, then what bad or ludicrous consequences may occur? Defend against accusations of your presenting something new. Slavery was accepted for thousands of years and is no more. If something is new, something is not previously considered, that does not automatically mean it's bad. An example of a counterattack. We trusted your group several years ago about this problem and the result was a mess. Were we wrong to trust you? Here are examples of a hidden agenda at work. Alert participants challenge the presenters, weakening their presentation. Notice how the issue of the rights of landowners is repeatedly dodged. The Greenbelt Alliance presenter did not want to identify his affiliation. Hooray for the stubborn participant who forced him to identify himself. Oh, you were saying like farms then being developed into urban housing. That's right. Using this as a high priority would be maybe you want to keep them from be from even doing that. Th that's right. And I, I mean, I wouldn't want to sell it, but if I did, and I was going to, I don't know, have some ugly, I don't know, like a Walmart or a high rise, you're saying if it's a high priority to conserve open spaces, we'd want to implement something to where they would discourage me from selling it? Okay. Right. I was Excuse me, how about the gov you want the government to set a priority of of controlling how people use their property is that what you're saying is this what this is what this is all about uh, so so the, that's what this question is about so the question was are we expecting the government to set a priority about conserving open space about how people use their personal property so if somebody owns the property
property, then we're saying that we're voting for the government to be able to take over this person's property. Right. Yes, sir. Now, I'm just worried about the, the moral authority of even asking the question. Thank you. Where Where are the property owners in this process? Are, are there representatives yeah. here, property, property owners? Yeah, we're, we're, we're very much hoping to engage the property owners in this conversation. That's why we're taking but these questions have, out I'm to the community. I'm a property owner. You have engaged them. Right. I'm a property I'm owner. And I, you know, it's so hard to make these choices. I want a small house and a big yard. I want to save school, but I have to drive my kids to school. I mean, it's very interesting that I, I'm concerned about the data that you're collecting under the auspices of Let's Keep It General. Excuse me, I'm a realtor. And I have a problem with us telling people that they can't build on their own property. That is a problem. It's private property. It's part of the constitution. That's part of our constitutional values for people to have and be able to do whatever they want with their own private property. And for us to sit here and say they can't use their own property and you're calling it open space. Open space is somebody's private property. I have a really big problem with that. Right, so the, com so the comment is... I wouldn't is want someone to tell me when I buy a piece of property that I can't build on it. I mean, uh, property rights. Oh, I mean, I, I, I have a home and I wouldn't want somebody to rezone it. They were just talking about that here. I don't want my house rezoned. I found a house, I fixed it up myself, and I, I landscaped it. I did everything to make my house beautiful and a beautiful home for my family. And I would be disgusted if I put that much effort into an old house to redevelop it, and then somebody come and tell me, well, we've decided that this is going to be something else. That would make me very sad. Right. And so I, that's what they're going to I, th do. I think these points that you're making are critical because it's about the... I have a great neighborhood with wonderful families, and we've all done a great job of planning it ourselves. And re refixing it up and doing things for it. So, so I can't Madam Speaker, if you start at the 30,000 foot level with a vision and it's not grounded in realities at the bottom, yes. then you're going to end up with answers to your questions that create a false vision that can never be implemented. Yes. Generic handouts. Have someone distribute handouts that describe possible dishonest tactics of those who run public hearings. Do not mention names or issues in these handouts. If challenged, you can say that if the hearing is honorably run, then the handout is irrelevant, and you are simply trying to educate the citizenry. If the enemy interferes, it thereby admits evil intent. Handouts for the specific hearing. Do not accuse anyone of dishonesty. If true, you are picking a fight and most people won't want to get involved. If false, that's worse. But do mention cash flow, who benefits, who loses, the issue of fair compensation for property value loss, any consultants that are paid to make a presentation, and other factual issues. The handout should emphasize that the issues are important and you hope they will be discussed openly and fairly. Get help if available. Recruit allies who will attend the hearing. Discuss strategy beforehand. When at the hearing, pretend that you don't know each other. Arrive separately and leave separately. Dress normally and preserve an ordinary demeanor. Do not look or act strange or threatening in any way. One or two should have support your local police stickers on clipboards. They may deter an antagonistic police chief. Don't all use those stickers or you will look like you are part of a group. Your recruited help. Four kinds of participants in your group. The lion, the lion cub, the fox, and the mole. The lion is openly opposed to what the enemy is trying to do and displays power in voice and in body language. The lion is a visible target to the enemy. The lion is vulnerable to being successfully labeled rude by the presenters and thereby rendered irrelevant by the neutrals. The lion cub is planted in the audience to speak up and agree with the lion. That way, the lion will not appear to be a single far-out extremist, but someone with credible ideas. It's easy for a presenter to disagree with one person 
and label him, less likely her, a wacko. It's harder if several people agree with the one person and disagree with the presenter. The fox is sly and cunning. The fox's role is harder to learn, but more fun to do. Part of the strategy of Oriental martial arts is the principle of using the opponent's weight against him. The fox will do it too, by leveraging the presenter's reasoning against the presenter's own conclusions. Properly used, the fox's tactics will make the presenter look ridiculous. The mole is shy and does not want to be seen. A mole can distribute handouts before the hearing, then not attend the hearing itself at all. Then handouts cannot be connected to anyone who speaks out. A mole can also stand near the presenters during an unscheduled break and listen to their discussion. If there is a constructive exit, a mole can be part of the apparent crowd. More on this concept later. A person may take more than one role. Lion, lion cub, fox, and mole. Divide the tasks according to personalities, interests, and needs for a particular hearing. Have a meeting before the hearing and assign tasks. Who will raise various questions? Who will interrupt to agree with them? Who will distribute handouts? Consider two or three such meetings. However angry you are about the enemy's evil tactics, do not waste time talking out feelings. Your meeting or meetings will be councils of war, making battle plans and preparing to overpower the enemy. Practice your questions, arguments, etc. out loud. This is important. Get up and act it out as for an imaginary audience. Don't sit still and recite the words, thinking you will learn things thoroughly. You won't. The standing, hand gestures, and speaking will help you remember what you will later do. Also, it is easier to find an error in your scripts, and the embarrassment will be much less if you find it during rehearsal than if you are at the hearing itself. Try to visit the site of the meeting beforehand. Inspect the wires that connect microphones, etc., to the room's public address system. Try to learn how to connect your own equipment in case you get a chance to do so. Unlikely. If the enemy intends to transmit the hearing to the local public access station, call the station and offer a backup live feed, perhaps through the Internet, in case of technical difficulties during the broadcast. Arranging for such a live feed does take some technical knowledge. Learn each other's mobile phone numbers. Be ready to send text messages to each other silently. One person should have a phone programmed to respond to exactly one other person with a disruptive ringtone. The disruption will be helpful when fighting trance induction discussed below. Learn the seating arrangements so that you and your team can decide where to sit. Plan to disperse yourselves throughout the audience area. Don't bunch up together. Is there a nearby meeting room of which the door is not locked? If you want to leave before the meeting ends, what is your departure route? Plan to arrive and leave separately, pretending that you do not know each other. At the hearing site, just before the hearing is called to order, Two or three of you should stage a petty argument so observers will think you don't know and obviously don't like each other. This argument is part of your disguise. Of four of you, one should be at front center, one at rear center, one each far left and far right, midway between front and rear. Additional people should be scattered around also, if available. Frequent head turning by the neutrals makes them feel that your political allies are more numerous than they really are. Get the schedule of breaks in advance. If the hearing does not work out the way the enemy wants it to, then the presenters are likely to call an unscheduled break and discuss changes of strategy. If you pin down the presenters to a schedule, then a break to allow a change of strategy can be exposed as such. You can ask with the demeanor of a competent but busy reporter who has to know when to call in news. Knowing that a break is unplanned can be very valuable later. Who is the enemy? Watch this presenter parry a question about his organization. 
One of our heroes later pins him down firm. Excuse me, can you tell me who Greenbelt Alliance is? Honestly, I've never heard of you guys before. And I would encourage you all to hold your questions until the end. One option of many options is to raise additional revenue to implement some of these improvements by leveling the cost playing field between cars and other forms of transit. Greenbelt Alliance has always opposed all new road building, correct? I do not know of a single case. I used to be a member of Greenbelt Alliance. And when you said, look, we need to spread this money around, the vast majority of that needs to go into road improvements. I'm not against your, your designs in the center of cities, but Greenbelt Alliance is kept saying we need more rail and, and light rail. That's hopelessly cost ineffective. Well, thank you. So These are the sorts of things that we want to be able to hear right, from right. I think you all this morning. I think it's so I'm going to turn it back to the facilitator who can lead yes, us through I the next exercise. I think it's important that everybody here knows this is not a government okay. meeting. It's by the Silicon Valley Manufacturers Association. I thought this was a government right. meeting. Okay. It's not actually. It's actually a, a private foundation with a lot of these somewhat biased groups. Right. And Greenbelt Alliance definitely has a bias. The enemy's theory. Rely on consensus. Get everyone to agree with the favorite agenda. Never compromise. Make the good guys compromise. Censor dissent, as by peer pressure. Hegelian dialectic, as used here, introduce the opposite of the public's prevailing opinion, the right one, and contrive a discussion toward a compromise, such compromise being the presenter's favorite. Wear out the audience by switching sides during any discussion so that people are likely to come to a consensus if only because they are cognitively exhausted. Dirty Tricks of the Enemy Making participants choose one of a few undesirable options Secret ballot by electronic device Practice voting on that device on trivial questions to get used to not thinking before voting Bar graph with the edge of the bars not at true zero, so as to magnify small differences. And a command, quote, trust the facilitator, unquote. You also have a keypad polling device. Um, because what we're going to be doing for the first little bit of this segment is just kind of asking some questions about who's in the room to get a feel for the diversity that's represented. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an average for all of these and then we're going to rank and, and sort them so we can look at scenarios according to your own priorities. And so we've got two options there. Obviously the reality is going to be a little bit of a mixture of both, but if you had to pick one of the two of these, which would be your first choice in terms of moving forward and looking at the scenario? Excuse me. Yes. This is designed to show that transit is what people want because of the ten cards we have, six said increased transit, only two said increased road. East County needs Highway 4 widening and Vasco Road widening. I agree. And what happens is, this is great, it's great. And this happened in the, the charrette we had in Walnut Creek, where you have put six, ten choices, you choose four cards, and so some of them, half say, you put, only two are for roads. Okay. So you only have two roads, the other two are going to transit, and then the result is, wow, yeah. most people want us, half the people want to spend money on transit. I'm, I'm, it's I'm false. Yeah. It's a disgrace. Okay. I'm hearing, I'm seeing a lot of nodding, so I think we will take that input, and thank you very much. Which of the three policy initiatives did your small group choose? Signing in. The enemy wants you to sign in, register, and wear a name tag. That way you can be harassed later or not called on if you attend a subsequent meeting. Defense. Try not to sign in, smudge the name on or lose the name tag, try not to be video recorded, ladies please wear floppy hats to interfere with having your faces easily recorded. Have one of your allies sign in properly using a real name and real email address so as to acquire notices about future meetings. This ally should not be conspicuous except possibly at the constructive exit, more on that later. A mole is an ideal person to sign in honestly. You need one honest sign-in, you do not need all honest sign-ins. The movie. A movie may be shown at the start of the presentation. 
It looks like a simple way to provide information, and occasionally it is honestly used for that purpose. Two reasons for suspicion. First, it may be intended for emotional shock value, especially if it is not openly available beforehand on the Internet or elsewhere. Second, it prevents interruptions from viewers, you, for example, who might interrupt a live presenter with questions or disagreement. Defense against misuse of the movie. Interrupt the presenter just after it is being announced. Rude, but do it anyway. This is not a popularity contest. Say that it seems to be important for the public to know about, which is why it is being shown, and ask where it is available on the Internet. Pretend you assume it is available. Make the presenter awkwardly deny its availability if it is not. This question traps the presenter. It uses the agreement principle discussed later. Defense against misuse of the movie. An honest presenter will simply tell you where it is on the Internet and that you can view it for free. If the hearing is honestly run, a way to view the movie beforehand will be announced before the hearing. That way, you and your associates can discuss it before the hearing and there will be no emotional surprise or shock at the hearing itself. A dishonest presenter will use the movie for its shock value. Suspect any reason given for the movie's absence from the Internet if it is a tool for a public hearing. That's a shame about the copyright holder's attitude, you say, for example. If the content is so important for us, the general public, to know, wouldn't the copyright holder want the movie on the Internet? Ask how long the movie is, how long the entire hearing will be, and how much time there will be for questions from the public. Pretend you know there will be questions. Make the presenter say out loud, no, there won't be any, if that is the case. These questions will probably receive simple answers. But you are quietly trapping the presenter. If the movie took up enough time to crowd out questions from the public, the presenter can later be induced to take the blame. Time for questions? A promise may be made that questions will be taken later. Such promises are broken more often than they are kept. They are intended to keep skeptics like ourselves quiet and malleable, not to inform us of the truth about how the hearing will be conducted. If the promise is broken, then you have no clear recourse unless you prepare for the possibility. Here is a presenter promising time for questions. I'll answer questions at the end. And I'm going to answer, there'll be time to answer some of these questions at the end. Later. Thank you. You were going to answer, answer some questions. Yeah, I think if you want to go to the next you to answer questions. Yeah, answer answer questions. We gave you the time to talk. We want the questions answered now, sir. Yeah. Uh-oh, the promise was not kept. Too bad the audience did not prepare for this possibility. When a promise is made that questions will be accepted later, interrupt the presenter immediately. Rude, but do it anyway. The lion says, Thank you for your promise to take questions. As surety for that promise, are you willing to stipulate that this hearing shall not be construed as being a hearing mandated for legislative changes or as being admissible for any other official purpose if we the people have less than half an hour for questions and answers? Learn this wording. An honest presenter will cooperate. A dishonest presenter will be stuck. A dishonest presenter will get evasive or try to attack you personally. A presenter who says he is not authorized to waive admissibility of the hearing can be asked point blank, is anyone present at this hearing who is authorized to waive its admissibility? If not, then who is running the hearing? Bring out the contradiction and the neutrals will be on guard even before any content has been disclosed. Putting the neutrals on guard quickly is very important. You want them skeptical from the first minute and not catch on only later. Whatever the presenter says when asked about that promise, bring it up again if the presenter gets long-winded and seems interested in deliberately stealing time from audience questions that would be asked later. You could have instead said 10-word summary. We will still have time for questions from the audience, right? If so, that's good. If not, then the audience has been reminded again and will be hostile to the presenter. If you were later told, we are out of time, then remind everyone of any time-wasting ruses that were used. 
Censorship of live feeds. A live feed can be planned by the enemy that goes to the local public address cable station or satellite. Expect it to be sabotaged if the enemy becomes embarrassed. Mass media, the media organization reproducing obvious nonsense, tend to cooperate with the enemy. Do not expect the mass media to explain or compensate for a loss of live coverage due to technical difficulties. Defense. Have a camcorder connected to an internet live feed that is not under the enemy's control, preferably with a battery pack and a mobile phone that supports internet connections. If you are told by your spy who is off-site watching public access that the connection is lost, call the cable or satellite company at once and offer your live feed. Safer. Have two camcorders, one obvious, one inconspicuous. Use the obvious one if permitted. If the camcorder use is challenged, the mole holding the inconspicuous camcorder can record the challenge with the inconspicuous one, and the censorship will be proven and later uploadable on the Internet. The Sexy Presenter Assume that a well-dressed model appearance presenter with suggestive mannerisms is using sexual tension to manipulate. If you allow yourself to respond emotionally, you will be weakened. The trick is to not be susceptible. Fortunately, if you immediately look and listen and try to figure out why you react as you do, sexual tension disappears instantly. Make a mental list of characteristics such as height, approximate weight, hair, details of clothing, shoes, pattern of walking, mannerisms of speech, lilt of voice, eye contact, head tilting, anything that you would need to describe this person on a police report or if you are writing fiction. As soon as you go into list-making mode, the reaction disappears. The Trance Induction – Methods of Presenters Speaking with unnatural pauses between pairs of words that do not deserve them so as to implant secondary phrases and meanings and overwhelm the ability to decode the words into meanings. Deliberate monotone to induce boredom and discourage active skepticism. Trick questions to induce you to think per presenter's way you should think. This list is not complete. Other methods exist, too. Speaking with unnatural pauses. People who do not seriously consider my land grab proposal can be described as There is a secret command. Seriously consider my land grab proposal, whatever the end of the sentence really is. Defense. Ask the presenter to repeat himself or herself. Notice if pauses are repeated too. Deliberate monotone to induce boredom and discourage active skepticism. Experienced trial lawyers know that although they are supposed to bring about a jury decision in favor of their client, they don't have to do so by keeping the jury interested. Unwanted ideas can slip into your thinking if you do not remain on guard. Defense. If there seems to be a staged, monotonous presentation, ask lively questions to 1. Interrupt and 2. Override boredom. Trick questions to induce you to think according to the presenter's way you should think. Two favorites are, what comes to mind when I say, and what would you think or do if I told you that? Another is, what do you think is the greatest challenge in the context of? These questions seem like simple solicitations of opinions, but a person cannot answer them in good faith without going into a trance while figuring out an honest answer. Defense against what comes to mind when I say, the true answer, you're not my psychoanalyst, that's private. You don't want to fall in a trance, and you don't want to tell the presenter how you think so as to make his or her work any easier. Say, you're the one presenting the issue. Let's hear what comes to your mind when you say. Insist on receiving the presenter's information, pleading ignorance as needed. Make the presenter do the presentation. Defense against, what would you think or do if I told you that? At a trial in court, a good witness up against an adverse attorney might answer, you mean as a witness, sworn in and subject to cross-examination? The presenter is trying to trick you into reacting to a non-fact as if it was a fact. Say, well, is that really true? It won't be, or the presenter would have said so, not said, what do you think? Presenter replies, no. 
continue. Okay, let's deal with the actual facts, which are, and then fill them in. The generic defense, interrupt, interrupt, interrupt. Do something loud and unexpected and the trance is broken. If you look flustered, not defiant when you do that, an angry presenter will look like a jerk, and you won't. Wonder aloud where your name tag is, it's hidden in your pocket. Drop a clipboard or purse. Excuse yourself for an urgent restroom break. No one person should do an interruption more than once. The sole exception to the no-repeat rule is the fake loud sneeze. Cover your nose and mouth with a handkerchief and blast away. Tell those seated nearby that you forgot your allergy pill and apologize for the interruption. You don't want them afraid of catching cold. The noisy mobile phone can also be used. Contrive a catchy ringtone and have an ally send you a dummy message just so the ringtone will be heard. Tax and spend. Tax, tax and spend. Waste, inefficiency, fraud. Be sure to fidget earnestly and apparently purposefully. Having your phone in one of several zipper pockets so you apparently can't find it in a hurry is a plus. Push for consensus. A compromise is an outcome that satisfies no one but approximately satisfies people as much as possible. It is an honest outcome and is consistent with irreconcilable disagreement. A consensus is an outcome with which everyone agrees. It usually cannot be achieved in a diverse group of people without some form of brainwashing. Remember, if you're not allowed to disagree, the process is wrong. Consensus is often sought by the enemy. It provides apparent unanimous agreement with enemy plans instead of simply a majority. It also prevents obstruction by those who disagree, because there are none who disagree. In theory, nothing is wrong with consensus. In practice, consensus is a danger sign because it has probably, not always, been reached through dishonest means. Defense against consensus. Explain that you hope for an outcome that has a well-discussed prevailing opinion and that you expect some dissenters. Give as an example the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court rarely expresses unanimous opinions. Emphasize that it is okay if a fair debate leads to a majority opinion and the minority peaceably accepts it. Requiring unanimous belief resembles communism. The Dirty Done Deal the presenters may say that they are seeking information about public opinion. If you are careful and they are not, you can catch them in a contradiction. Watch these presenters say that so much preparation has been done for a predetermined plan that public opinion is by now irrelevant, while they say they want public opinion. Hypocrisy exposed. But this is the first time we have substantively put together development, housing, land use patterns with transportation investment. You're not giving us our, a choice to say we don't like any of them. But you know, we've been working on this for about That's six right. to seven months. So if you feel like you're, you're questioning the process, I completely invite you to um, raise that with your local representatives. You, you all have representatives here in Contra Costa that sit on the MTC and on ABAG board. Um, and let them know about your, your questions and concerns about this process. We have a, a summary level kind of feedback. Um, and there will be, as I mentioned, information from all of these workshops up online. Um, again, participants put down the keypad. We're just asking facilitators to weigh in. And I think you can trust your facilitator to report. The Hegelian dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic, as the phrase is used here, is the process of taking one extreme position, discussing it while discussing the opposite extreme position, and creating and defending an intermediate viewpoint. The enemy can take your rational position, invent an opposite position that is very far out and beyond the enemy's intended position, and work toward the intended intermediate viewpoint. This intermediate viewpoint may actually be extreme. It is merely less extreme than the invented far out position. It is also the enemy's preferred outcome. Detecting the Hegelian dialectic. Remember your original beliefs and the facts from which they are derived. Do not let anything change your beliefs except proper presentation of facts. 
Watch for presenters whose stated viewpoints change during the proceedings. Ask presenters who mention various viewpoints if they represent the presenter's real opinions. An evasive answer suggests Hegelian dialectic at work. The cooperative answer. Early in the presentation, if the presenter asks a loaded question and is obviously seeking a particular answer, offer it immediately. This tactic seems to be helping the enemy, but if you don't, then someone else in the audience will and most likely the someone else won't be an ally. By offering the desired answer, you are investing in goodwill and the presenter is likely to call on you later. When called on later, you can give an answer that is damaging to the enemy and favorable to your cause. Agreement. The fox will use the agreement principle often. Whenever possible, begin a question or an interruption by agreeing with the apparent intent of the presenter, then make your point after doing so. Never openly argue, but make argument difficult for the presenter. The presenter can't argue with you if you agree. Caution: Presenters often start their replies to your questions with apparent agreement, then transition to their biased and evasive stuff. Martial arts teach the principle of using the opponent's own weight and momentum against him. The fox will do it, too. Show that the enemy's stated opinion leads to a ludicrous or otherwise unwanted conclusion. Then the presenter looks ridiculous or unreasonable, and you don't. Choose your wording so as to be for something, not against it. Negative question. If you want to make a point, try to do so with a question that includes not or a contraction of not, isn't, doesn't, don't, etc. Doing so limits the possible responses of the presenter. You are trying to pin down the presenter so as to either concede that you are right, very unlikely if the presenter is well prepared, or, more likely, be seen by the neutrals as unreasonable. Your implied allies. If you want to make a point, Try to do so by mentioning many of us, most of us, everyone where I work, etc. Don't state your opinion as if it is only your own. First, you are cueing the lion cubs to chime in when you are finished and the presenter has responded. Second, you are inviting the neutrals to agree with you even if they hesitate to follow a maverick or what looks like an extremist. Third, you scare off a presenter's attack that presumes you are alone and no one else holds your opinion. Answering the wrong question. Beware an answer that does not match the question exactly. It is a trick used by dishonest presenters to divert discussion from the real issue to one that they prefer to review. Experts call this process reframing the debate, changing what is being discussed from the original true issue to a side issue or something related but actually irrelevant. You and your allies need to attack all reframing attempts. Keep the discussion on the real issues and avoid distractors. If you say, excuse me, that did not answer the question, then you seem pushy and can be accused of rudeness. But if someone else says that, then you are blameless and the neutrals know that two people are interested in the true question, not just you. The someone else should add, you answered, then state the different unasked question that the presenter really did answer. Try to have a third person chime in after the second one, the first ally, speaks up. More about reframing the debate. The presenter's content may, by design, veer from the true topic of interest. Only an interruption can help. To avoid seeming pushy, wait until the content is obviously irrelevant before speaking up. A restrictive answer, one that actually says little, by a presenter can be challenged. Pretend to agree with such an answer, then firmly redirect the discussion to the true issue. Tautology A tautology is an invalid form of logic in which one fact is proved from a second and the second is proved from the first. The state government endorsed this education plan because the school boards say they like it. School boards like the plan because the state government endorsed it. Either statement alone is credible, though worthy of further inquiry. If they are offered together, the logic fraud is obvious. Fearless embarrassment. Part of the plan of the enemy is to use your fear of embarrassment to coerce you into agreeing, or pretending to agree. 
Many people, often extroverts or the weak-willed, will not speak up if they do not understand something, even if their inquiry would expose a flaw in the presenter's argument. A dishonest presenter may try to discourage scrutiny, and will exploit this hesitation to ask about a deliberately muddied concept. Then each victim will think only he or she does not understand or does not agree, and everyone else understands and agrees. Be brave and ask your question. If you ask a question that may be awkward, or you feel shy and uneasy, then mention the embarrassment and awkwardness explicitly. That way the neutrals notice it and the enemy knows that the weapon of embarrassment won't work. If the presenter openly embarrasses you and you have no witty reply, laugh vigorously. Pretend to enjoy the process. Then your allies have a few th seconds to think and to come up with a witty defense for you. Social pressure. As just noted, most people try to avoid ridicule and embarrassment. If the price paid is sacrificing a fight for what one stands for, so be it. Or so the enemy hopes. The smear. Even an idiot would understand my position. Comparison with the undesirable. That's the way extremists talk. The team. Let's agree on this one. Let's sacrifice individual opinions and be united against this problem. The smear. If compared to an extremist group or similarly attacked, accept the comparison without apology and divert the discussion back to the original issue. Do not argue with or respond to any emotional content. You are trying to prove that the presenter is unbalanced and you are rational. The smear is an opportunity to do so. Defense against the smear. Even an idiot would understand my position. Do not react with anger. If you appear angry, the enemy wins. If the enemy appears angry, you win. If at all realistic, laugh. Agree with the comparison, then return the emphasis to the original issue. Well, well, what do you know? I seem to have something in common with idiots. The facts are, list a few, we need to consider an additional pertinent fact not mentioned, and let's discuss the issue itself. The team. Let's agree on this one. Let's sacrifice individual opinions and be united against this problem. Again, agree in principle. Then use the apparent motive of the enemy for your own purpose. We will have to make some sacrifices to solve this big problem, true. But first we need to agree on what to do about it so we are not accidentally making it worse. Then bring up the facts and say, so let's discuss these criteria and approaches. Conversational distortion. Conversational distortion is the departure of speech from fair debate so as to affect a predetermined outcome. It requires a shift from logical thought, otherwise it will be identified as an unfair tactic. A trance induction is a method. Appeals to emotion constitute another method. Buzzwords, slogans, and deliberately vaguely defined words constitute still another method. Appeals to experts and undisclosed presumptions are others. Appeals to emotion. The presenter tries to impose an emotional state. Fear, compassion, or the satisfaction of social approval. Suspect a deliberate appeal to emotion if a video presentation is made and it has emotional content. Strong emotions weaken the logical thought processes that you need. The presenter hopes you will decide wrongly while weak. Your defense. Remember that an issue is being discussed and you are trying to use fair debate to effect a good decision. More important than your personal vote, make sure everyone thinks rationally too. Say, that speech or movie or presentation sure makes a strong case that we have a problem, but we already knew that or we wouldn't be here. Let's stay rational and discuss these various options. Defense against buzzwords and words with vague definitions. If you sound knowledgeable and authoritative when you challenge the presenter, you look as if you are in a power struggle. And you are in a power struggle. But you should not induce a clear confrontation because the presenter is in charge. You are likely to lose such a struggle if you make its existence obvious. This is a job for the fox not the lion. Interrupt, appearing befuddled and stupid. Apologize for interrupting, then ask what is meant by paradigm or whatever, and insist on understanding what the presenter is saying. You are announcing an intent to understand, so you cannot be dismissed as closed-minded. You are also using a tactic fearless embarrassment. 
The presenter pretty much has to admit that you are not supposed to understand if you corner him or her into a confusing answer. Try, if possible, to make the presenter give clear definitions for all buzzwords and technical jargon. The presenter hopes he will passively follow along with the presentation and not quite understand the facts, but you have derailed that train of thought by insisting on factual clarity. When facts are clear, rational decisions will be made. Slogans are catchy phrases that often oversimplify concepts. They can provide good summaries for legitimate concepts. They are problems only when their existence is used to justify their meaning. Haven't you heard the slogan, Global Warming? Absolute defense against implicitly trusting a slogan. I've heard Heil Hitler, too, but I don't agree with it. Another misuse of slogans. Apparent agreement based on deliberate ambiguity. Improve the plight of the poor may mean increasing their welfare payments. It may instead mean erasing zoning laws and building codes so that they can live more cheaply and walk to workplaces. Do you want to improve the plight of the poor? Yes? You just agreed to whatever the presenter wanted you to agree with. Appeals to experts. If someone has studied a problem for years, written books, and taught in college, then that person can be presumed to be very knowledgeable. But that does not mean trustworthy. The Pope thought the world was flat, and so did his associates, but Galileo said it was round. The Pope's experts were wrong. Irrelevant qualifications have been offered for centuries. The Pope said the world was flat. Who oversees the credential-giving people? May 6, 1985. Congressional hearing on farm problems. Actresses Jane Fonda and Sissy Spacek testified at the hearing, for they played the part of farmers in movies. They were not real farmers. Their testimony is relevant only if Congress is not actually governing, but just acting as if it did. Defense. Ask the expert, if present, to explain the reasoning for his or her position. A sign of genuine expertise is the ability to explain a difficult concept so that ordinary people can understand it. Beware the expert who does not succeed, or, worse, does not even try to explain a difficult concept so that the average citizen can understand it. Ask the presenter if opposing experts will speak, too. Of course the answer is no. You are trying to show bias. Ask the expert to disclose opposing viewpoints and explain why their reasoning is wrong. Once again, you are trying to show bias to the neutrals. You may be told that the answer is too complicated. Ask your prepared complicated question to prove that you and your cohorts can withstand complicated concepts. Then the expert will be trapped, either answer the original question honestly, or be exposed as biased. If the expert is not present, then ask the presenter for a discussion of like, kind, and quality about opposing viewpoints. Remember the contradiction. An honest presenter cannot consider you both mentally impotent, thus dependent on experts, and of sound mind and able to render an opinion of any usefulness. Studies have shown no significant correlation. If the likelihood that two things occur together by chance is more than 1 in 20, 1 20th, then the convention in professional literature is to say no significant correlation. Therefore, a weak but important correlation may be censored, as by the enemy. A correlation may not be significant, but is it really totally absent? Find out. Ask. Cause and effect can be misrepresented. Is poor student performance caused by underpaid teachers? You can't make that inference by comparing student performance in various classes with teacher pay. If a correlation is found, then it may justify further inquiry, but not a jump to such a conclusion. Undisclosed presumptions. What looks like a simple fact or opinion is actually an inference from facts or opinions that are not mentioned. If you disagree with the unspoken facts or opinions, 
you may not figure out why you dislike the inference. Ask yourself what the inference or opinion is and where it came from. Ask out loud if you need to. What else? This ruse is used by dishonest presenters who discuss a problem to divert attention from your favorite solution so that other approaches, including their own favorites, can be discussed too. It can be an honest way to seek alternative approaches, but it can be misused. A presenter can hope your solution will be forgotten. When replying by mentioning such alternative approaches, mention your favorite as a side issue every time so that neutrals won't be tempted to forget it. The Implication The presenter may react to your awkward or unwelcome comment by asking crossly, Are you implying that I am? Ending with a comparison to a selfish or extremist position or group. Your reply. No, but you are. I never said anything about that person or group at all. Why are you thinking of it at all? This defense works only if your awkward or unwelcome comment does not include any such implication explicitly. The sham vote. Perhaps you will be asked to vote on your preference. Choose one of several options, all of which you don't like. No, none of the above is offered. Sure, you can write in none of the above. But speak up and cue in others to do so, too. Watch what happened when the absence of none of the above was noted by a skeptic. We want to feel, we, this was not designed to field all your questions. It wasn't. And for that, You're I will pop. You're asking us to vote what? on things that we don't agree with. Then what? don't vote on them. Vote yes or abstain. Yeah, right. This is not the Kremlin. This is the USA. The sham vote. Who counts the ballots and reads the comments? How do you know that the public comments that are later made public fairly represent the comments that were turned in? You don't. When comment cards or ballots are distributed, ask politely but loudly if you and a few others can watch them counted and reviewed before the meeting breaks up. No? End of the credibility of the ballots and comments. Say so. The unscheduled break. A break may be called if the presenter is troubled by resistance, yours or that of other skeptics, to the pre-planned agenda. You caught it as an unscheduled break by asking earlier when the breaks will be. Now the presenters have given themselves away. During the break, have a mole walk casually to where they are discussing their strategy and listen in. Cover. A second ally chatters to the mole, who pretends to listen to the chatterer, but actually listens to the presenters as they plan their revised strategy. The unscheduled break is good news. The enemy is retreating. The mole is gathering information to be text page to you and your allies. But that's not all. You have an important opportunity that will last for only a few seconds. Act fast! The lion should go to the front of the room, to the microphone if possible, and try to begin an honest presentation and discussion. Don't ask permission. Pretend it's already there. Not true, but pretend anyway. Expect the enemy to stop him or her. The lion says, Who wants me to continue? Show of hands! Then raises a hand, and so do the allies. If there is support for an impromptu presentation until the presenters end their break, the presenters look like jerks if they censor it. If someone not in your group, a possible ally, wants to speak up too, then the presenters have probably lost control permanently, which means you win. Back off. Let the other person speak. Don't make it look as if you are hogging the microphone. Spread the victory. Cooperate when told to stop speaking. Make the presenters look bad, not you. But ask for a show of hands while walking away from the podium. You won't get your way on that podium, but the audience will be reminded of how many agree with you and with each other. Breakouts. In an honest hearing, everyone hears you. In a fake hearing in which the large group is broken up, you and others are divided up into small discussion groups, often at round tables. 
If you talk and a few people hear you, the emotional effect on you is similar to that when you talk and many people hear you. Then you get the feeling of having spoken your mind, but most people at the hearing don't hear you at all. A second unwanted effect of being broken up into discussion groups. You will be unable to attend to every topic of discussion if two or more different topics are receiving attention at the same time. Representation of the event as a public hearing about all such topics is therefore dishonest and misleading. Fair debate involves a presentation of an issue, then questions and answers with all viewpoints being considered and no bias. Everyone gets to observe all proceedings in a fair debate. If you are told to choose to discuss one of two or more sub-issues, then you are forced to forfeit access to all of the other sub-issues. This process is incompatible with a fair debate. Say so. Try to prevent breakouts into separate discussion groups, but expect to fail if the presentation was carefully planned. You can succeed in alerting the neutrals so they will, you hope, be suspicious. Say, but if someone in that other group says something that would convince me to agree with you and I don't hear it, then I will continue to disagree. Is that what you want? Does the presenter want you to keep your disagreement or to abandon the breakouts? Either way, the presenter loses and you win. In a brainstorm that is part of a breakout session, approaches to solving a problem are solicited. The what else trick may be tried. Defense. When responding to a make-a-list question about solutions to a problem, always say the number of items already on the list. That way the presenter cannot pretend to forget any of them, including your favorite. Return to your favorite if the presenter is about to infer a consensus. Detecting plants in shills. As you and your group are secretly allied, assume that the enemy has secret allies too. If at a round table discussion, Converse with your table mates about generic topics and conceal your background and opinion. Observe the body language and degree of enthusiasm and complexity of sentence structure of your table mates. Then allow the discussion to switch to the issue and observe again. Make a trivial but clear mistake when reciting the facts of the issue, not an indefensible opinion, a false fact. If speech becomes more rapid, sentence structure becomes more complex, and enthusiasm increases when the topic shifts to the issue then you are probably observing a shill. If an allegedly non-committal table mate catches your factual mistake, and it is obscure enough to not be obvious, then you are probably dealing with someone who is prepared well and does not want to be seen as such. A shill. Correct your factual error with well-faked embarrassment. Then disclose your detection skills and your inference to the other table mates. Questionnaires and checklists. Assume that if questionnaires are used, then they will be used to make table mates argue with each other. Do not cooperate with the questionnaire by ranking things in order of preference. If clean air is good and so is access to transportation, say that they are good. If control over land used by people other than their owners is bad, say that it is bad. Remember, legislators will eventually say yes to some things and no to others. Laws permitting one thing and prohibiting another don't rank the good and the better, the bad and the worse. If there is a multiple choice question, or a series of them, and your preferred answer is none of the above, then write it in by hand and don't choose any pre-printed option. Otherwise, you will be misrepresented as approving one of the options on the multiple choice question. Tell your table mates that you are doing so, and why. If challenged by the table's presenter, insist on not being misunderstood, and stand firm. You are insisting on the right to choose none of the above, and to say yes or no instead of giving rank-ordered preferences. Someone not the table's presenter may object to your attitude. If so, and you have identified the person as a shill, explain your reasoning. Then the neutrals at the table will know that they have been set up, and will probably take your side. The ultimate breakout, the constructive exit. Use it if there is an obvious impasse appear bored, not argumentative. Say with a yawn, well, I guess I've done everything I can here. Then you get up and leave, and your allies leave with you. You hope to take some neutrals also. Write to the government agency that sponsored the hearing, and note that subsequent voting at the hearing is misleading. 
explain that because a significant number of people, you don't have to say it's only two, three, whatever, walked out, any questionnaires and any voting that followed do not necessarily represent the public's opinion. Politely insist that if the issue is important enough to be worthy of a hearing, then it is also important enough to be worthy of a formal election if the will of the public is relevant. If you noticed an unlocked meeting room earlier, offer to take your allies to it. Explain that you will be discussing your own point of view and will prepare a memo to the appropriate government agency. Insist on explaining. The presenter will probably try to stop you. But you can refute most such attempts. How to refute interference from a constructive exit to another meeting room by the presenter. Who supports my right to start my own discussion group? Show of hands! And immediately raise your hand. Your allies will do likewise. If enough neutrals also do so, then the presenter loses control and you win. Or, didn't we plan to have breakout sessions, you ask? It isn't part of my plan, protests the presenter. It's my plan, you reply. Rig debate, or whatever, isn't part of my plan. When in your own session in an adjacent room, or a parking lot, wherever, you can present your opinions to your new recruits. Your intent is to prepare a memo that describes your new group's opinions, including any persisting disagreements. Gather information, write the memo, and send it. The media will probably not cooperate. Use the Internet instead. The media invest in access to government sources by cooperating with the government and not publicizing dissent. Assume that shills from the enemy will try to interfere. Be authoritative and take firm control of the meeting. Interrupt the ramblers and the subject changers. Expose shills and tell them to get back to the main hearing. Let everyone get a fair chance to speak, including those who disagree with you, if they cooperate with fair debate. Congratulations, you started a new political group. The audience speaks out. Here are participants at that hearing who disliked the process. Don't take my word for it. Listen to them and check the internet for corroboration. I feel just a little manipulated. I was, you know, not given the choices or the choice to speak the views that I, I had. I was given the option to choose from choices predetermined for me. And I feel like my voice that I came to use wasn't given as much credence as the partnerships of these nonprofits that are already here, um, standing up, presenting the program to me, and I'm. I'm having a very hard time just deciphering how they are so involved so early on in the process when this is being presented to me as a citizen as a new beginning stage program. So I feel very twisted today in that direction. A lot of it seemed to be propaganda. Um, and so I, I would like to be able to have more of these forums where details to these plans are actually presented and we're not sort of Heard it into like these, you know, sort of predetermined choices uh, in terms of their ideas of what our plan for our city should be. It kind of like um, sympathetic to civil liberties, like they'd look the other way if you were smoking pot or something. And then I get here, and it turns out if there's all these other things you're doing they don't like, they would they would rule against you. Like, I don't know if you can do what they're trying to do, where it would work, or where it could protect freedom. Uh, because you, you don't have the freedom of where you can, you can live where you want to live and work where you want to work. I, it seems like it takes away some freedom to be able to accomplish what they want to accomplish. What we need is businesses that are local, that, that are involved in, in my locality. And there's, no, there's no, no, no indication of any kind of business that, that was invited here to come and to comment their, their views. So.